Hello everyone and welcome to episode two of our book club. I am delighted to be joined once again by Amber Barrett and also by Courtney Brosnan and this time around we are going to review Game On, The Unstoppable Rise of Women's Sport by Sue Anstis. Um, so guys you're very welcome. I am going to kick off because I really enjoyed this book. I just thought when I was reading it how far we've come. Okay there were an awful lot of stories in it that were pretty depressing mm. but for nearly every depressing story there was a brilliant story there was signs of progress there were things that made me realize that change can be made and also so many um just statistics and numbers showing increased participation increased viewerships sponsorships all of that now everything that was nearly achieved was a battle but at the same time it was it was really impressive to see what can be done in such a short space of time when a group of mostly women there are a lot of men there as well just put their heads down put their heads together and say right we are going to to force change and so many people did this in this book um amber to you first what were your thoughts on it yeah i would i would absolutely agree with that i think as you said for every kind of negative story there was like two or three more positive ones to follow up with it i think it definitely gave me an understanding of like i suppose things that have just we've nearly just come in preconceived ideas that have just existed. And just, I think finding out where these ideas have come from, which a lot of the, I think the information about women's football is something that's existed since the early 1900s. And yet you're still wondering how are we carrying attitudes from over a hundred years ago and still bringing them into modern day. And I think for me, reading so many different things that were, you know, doctors comments about women and why they can't exercise and yet, there's nearly some places in the world that attitude still exists. And it's just, I thought it was really, really fascinating to read. Yeah. Courtney, what about you? Yeah, I think it honestly, same as Amber, I think it was just amazing to kind of see the journey that we've been on playing women's football and just uh, in sport in general, just to kind of see those battles, those obstacles that we faced and in the sport to kind of all throughout, whether you're playing or working in journalism or things like that. So I think, Obviously it shows how difficult it's been, but how the progress is there. And then we keep continuing to make steps forward, which has been absolutely amazing. Yeah, I think you probably nailed the word there, Courtney, when you said journey, because it's certainly been um, a journey. And uh, like, I guess really, like as, as you pointed out as well, Amber, football was banned for so long and you know you you hear about it and you go oh yeah you know that happened but when you're actually reading stories about how popular it used to be like back in around world war one time it was nearly a case where women were verging on being semi-professional and professional and they were selling out big stadiums and that just seemed to strike fear within men that the that the perceptions that they would have had of, of gender might be um changing a little bit and they put a complete stop to it but for so long for 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 women not to be able to play football and the one that struck me was it was like 1979 in brazil when football was was still banned up until then which meant that like you couldn't bring a ball out into the street if you're a woman and, and kick around like you couldn't just go to the park with your pals and go for a kick around let alone play organized any organized football and like marcia was probably born around then like she was probably born in the mid 80s which wasn't that far past when it was being allowed played being allowed played so you know this notion that men's sport got to where it is all by themselves is just it kind of really rankles with me because when you think of all the, the the step ups that they had along the way the fact that women stayed at home and looked after the families and provided that stability so they could go out and develop their sport the fact that they were given all these grants for years and years and given stadiums and all that and you know while all this was happening in tandem women just weren't allowed to play sport which is really well football anyway which is really pretty phenomenal really amber yeah and i think you you got it right there i think definitely it was the threat of the power of women's football or women's sport and actually the rise and support that it was going to get and i think the reference was i think it was in was it in 1929 or 19 around the 1920s when there was the game in um, Goodison Park for the women yeah. that sold out 52,000 in Goodison Park and within six months they had they had told women they cannot lo lo no longer take part in that sport and you're sitting there thinking just like how how could this have been if the numbers had been so poor and so low you'd be like okay they you know they're not bringing in any crowd or no attention to it but the fact the attention was there like 50,000 people 
for a game 80, 90 years ago, when you were saying now the places were pushing for that all the time, we're pushing to get these types of crowds and it was there. And for me, it was a little bit of like a bittersweet moment where it was like, yes, it was great then to see the transition of what happened then when they fought for it. And then years later, they were able to come back in. But I just thought that what a, what a missed opportunity, the amount of development would have taken place in those 50 years or 60 years wherever it was called off, um for however long it was called off for and for me reading that it was just it was just difficult to understand that you know the ideology behind it but honestly Maria I think what you said about the threat to men I think that's exactly what it was and it was the threat to they would no longer be the number one in the spotlight you know so I think in many ways it was there was definitely parts of the book that I just found really I suppose just rack the brains to be honest with you how it was actually allowed and how it went on and yeah. elements of it still existing today I think a chapter that I'm going to go back and read over and over again again is the one on the whole concept of female um females being fragile and that oh, yeah, yeah. that seemed to be concocted really that the yeah. priority was protecting women's fertility and not allowing them to do anything that would put that into jeopardy but without there being any kind of science and there's a great line in, I think it's that chapter anyway, where they got 20 doctors to go along and watch women exercise and play, I think it was play football anyway, and the what they, the conclusion that they, these 20 doctors reached was that it's like they're not overexerting themselves any more than they would if they were doing, you know, a day of heavy washing. And um, the game was still banned, you know, which is just... Yeah phenomenal really but just that whole um that whole mindset that people had about I guess look Courtney when you think about it it was just what they thought saw women's purpose in the world was um back then which was to to go and stay at home and, and have babies and make sure that there was another generation of, of people coming through but the fact that everything else seemed to be stunted for them and um it's it's just really hard to read and I think especially then when you're a sport lover as well and you're just seeing the amount of women reading about the amount of women that would have tried to change that culture and for so long just can't even imagine the battles that they had to fight to just try and prove that you know we we can do other things besides stay at home and have babies and make sure the house is clean like we can at the very least go and play a game of football yeah definitely I feel like that's something that even today it's like you're still having that same argument or you see these comments on social media and things like that and it's just like this was uh 80 90 years ago but you're still seeing those same comments today so I think that's something that is always a problem in women's sports and something you're facing and you saw it recently in the news I think with the uh women's referees talking about how I think it was a male referee made the comment that oh you can't have a family and be a referee as well and it's just kind of continuing to push those stereotypes and say I can have kids, I can play sport and do other things besides, as you said, stay at home, stay in the kitchen, as they thought um, in the past was kind of the only responsibilities you were meant to have as a as a woman. Yeah, and, and I think that comes that's very clear in the book as well, you know, that Sue does talk to an awful lot of people who've had to break down boundaries. And a lot of those boundaries are the fact that things like journalism for women, sports journalism, they, it can be very difficult for people with young families because the hours and the travel. Um, again, elite sport is an, another thing that can be quite difficult for, for women when like it came back to a lot of it was if you do want to do other things like have a certain career or go on and have a family. Mm -hmm. And again, the boardrooms and just even just the high echelons of sport it seemed that they were quite closed off for women a lot of it was because you know women weren't sure whether they could do these things um coaching is another one as well that that proves to be a very difficult barrier to break down but slowly but surely throughout the book you see that there are women answering the questions and paving the pathways for other women so that there can be a stronger representation in many different facets not just what makes sport for you guys, which is what we see, you guys running around the pitch, but everything else that is so important to ensure that the future of sport is safeguarded for women. And Amber, like that, like as we, we, we saw, or as we read in this book, like that just doesn't stop what happens on the pitch. It's everything outside as well, all the representation in all the different bodies 
we need to see women there. We need to see women making decisions. We need to see women um, on the telly talking about sport, on panels, writing articles about it. And it's slowly changing. Um, print media seems to be a, a tricky one. Some of the, the boardrooms seem to be tricky. But I think as time goes on, we're starting to get there. And the book illustrates that. Yeah, and I think that even the last two weeks, there's been so many different things that I've seen through social media. Um, the three female refer officials that took over the the England game there a few weeks ago but then you know a lot of people it's yes it's great that this is happening but there's a quite a big deal made of it and it's the big deal is made because it's the first time happening or the second time happening and you're just wondering you know how is this not how is this not just something now that we're like okay there is a, a list of officials male or female it can be for any game it can be a male game it can be a women's game that they have the opportunity if they've done the sufficient amount of training to do it why why would it be any different women's rules to men's rules are not different so it's not like it's this complete you know diverse opportunity where it's like oh well, they have to know this this and this and I think as well as you talked about it you know the coaching is I think is the big thing and what one of the stories that came out of it that stuck me which is quite a well-known story is the story about Emma Hayes being offered the role at Wimbledon and she's playing she's arguably looking after one of the best women's club teams in the world at the minute and you know I think her response to that was fantastic where she was able to say, look, for me, it would be a step down. Whereas people were saying the opposite. They were saying it would be a step up for you to go and get involved in the men's game. Yes, professional. And yes, you know, Wimbledon are not a championship team or not a premiership, premiership team. And her attitude was just like, no, she was, I'm dealing with the best of the best in female football. Why would I, why would I lose that? Why would I give it up? And I think the problem is now you need more of that attitude where, there is going to be other other elements. It can be, I think, the argument with Phil Neville being appointed as the coach for the, the England team is a prime example. You know, if that was a female player with a long history of playing for England, playing for Manchester United and a good career, would she then be handed the role of an English job? No, probably not. It wouldn't happen. So I think when you're seeing these little things and it's, as you said, it's just there needs to be more women present in these positions. They need to be involved in decision-making. Um, it's like the, the argument about the doctors that Courtney mentioned earlier. And I think these doctors are all male doctors. They had no females involved in these decisions about female bodies. And I think it's that ignorance that is just something that's still, is still now. And I think it's definitely something that you hope, you hope to change. And it's something that I think does need to change for things to really progress even further. I think when as well, when you hear Emma saying things like that, it just it challenges the perceptions of what uh, people think somebody like Emma, who is successful, would want to do. And it also then changes the perception of women's football. And as more of these ideas were challenged, as we saw in the book, things started to change. And even from a journalism point of view, the fact that yes. women weren't allowed into locker rooms to interview players and the journalist in, in question had to go and fight it in pretty much the high court. But by doing that, she changed a situation for all the different women going through. So like that really struck me, just the battles, like even when it came to uh, the Ireland women's rugby jersey and the fact that it wasn't Ireland's women's players female players in the jerseys it was models that were modeling and it again had to it had to be highlighted before there was change and, and this is in the book as well but all these little things everything seems to be a battle it's like a century of battles to get to where we are and a lot of them are won a lot of them I think still aren't, aren't won yet and I, I think a big one Courtney is the fact that and I know a lot of the, the current uh, football and sports pundits have said this, that there doesn't seem to be an acceptance in a lot of facets of society that women can have opinions on football. They can fly mm -hmm. planes. They can operate on your heart. You know, they can um, cook your dinner. They can do absolutely anything in the whole world. But when it comes to a woman having an opinion on football, it's like it's just not allowed for a lot of people. And I think it was might have been Alex Scott or somebody that said that um, and I know that Jackie Oatley's interviewed in this and, and she does have a few pretty harrowing stories about experiences that that she had but it's something that I think is really important um, that needs to to change Courtney and, and do you feel like it's changing a little bit? Um, yeah I think definitely I think as you said it just highlights how far we've come and it's almost like women have to have that extra something to prove themselves I can't remember 
who in the book said it, but she was saying it's not if she's interviewing someone, it's not until she brings up some tactical part of the game when uh, the coach said, oh, you actually know about football. Like, of course, if you're a pundit, exactly. you're working as a journalist, yeah, yeah. you know, you're going to know your stuff. And I think um, I uh, what really struck me was Ian Wright talked a lot about it. He said, I've worked with absolutely amazing female pundits, Alex Scott, uh, Karen Carney, things like that. And it's just like, they have to come so much more prepared with everything because they can get under so much more scrutiny. It was, I think Karen Carney had all the problems with the Leeds United fans for actually doing her job and commenti- commentating on the game. And then you come to social media and she's getting absolutely ripped apart and people are making these comments for her doing her job. If you have someone like Ian Wright making those same comments, someone says, oh, that's all right. Like he's just being a bit harsh. So I think it's come a long way. It's amazing to see these women pundits and journalists and things like that. But as you said, it's just, they have much more to prove and it's it's a slow process, I think. And for something else that um, struck me about having come a long way is kind of the attitude to of sponsors as well to the game. Um, I remember hearing this years ago that marketeers used to think, okay, when it comes to girls, just shrink it and pink it and that will do. Or I know in the, in the book as well, they, they talk about adding sequence to things and, and just making them a little bit um, prettier for girls to be interested in it. And it, again, like took challenges of people to change that perception of what women want. So whether it's brands being represented by supermodels or brands being represented by athletes, I, I think that it's almost no longer acceptable for there to be marketing campaigns that don't reflect what sports women and sports girls are about now. And that's illustrated really well as well in the book. Yeah, and it's actually, it's funny, it's something that we actually talked about in, in the last book club was um, the little issue at the time of the, the comments made in the Irish rugby about, you know, the situation for the women getting changed out the back. And I think it was Mary Hannigan did the article. Where she said, it's not the organization that will be annoyed. It's the sponsorships who, the sponsor that will be the ones demanding that something has changed there. And I think for me, that was a really a bold statement in many ways, because the fact of the matter, it is now that the sponsors are coming on and they have now, you know, they have this idea of representation and being involved with women's teams now, they know that they are going to be, they're taking this 100% seriously. And I think for me, one of the things in the book that I always found fascinating, and like, the thing is, it's nearly, you understand this in a way, is like, you've seen it, we've all seen it at first hand, is like, this idea of that, like, if they're going to do a sponsorship day with the women, like, it's a, it's a sexualizing thing. It's like, they have to be wearing this outfit, or they have to be dressed like this, or they have to be talking about this. And I think you're just, you know, I think there was lots of teams had done different calendars and everything because they wanted to sell and raise money for World Cups and everything. And, you know, I just think the sponsorship thing is something that is definitely, and like, I think we can say it firsthand is changing here with Cadbury and Sky now getting involved with us. But it's like little things, like you said, you know, the Irish rugby team, the women's team, I think it also happened in New Zealand where it was models coming in to advertise the kit. And, you know, regardless of your opinion on female sport or whatever that just straight away just would not happen in a male player you don't when you see the new Barcelona kit or the new United kit it's not some fella who works for Hollister three days a week that's in it it's the players that are playing every single game who are going to be wearing it and I think also I think there was that great picture last year of um the little girl in her bedroom had the picture of the the goalkeeper up on her wall of the yeah she's dressed head to toe in that kit but she's not looking at that player as an oh that's a model I'm gonna wear she's looking at that's the player that I want I watch every weekend and that for me is something like it was you know you could use that image as advertising that is that is exactly what advertising is and I seen she actually mentioned in the book as well um Sue Ansis was the if she can see it she can be it and that was, I think, yeah. that was really, really good. I hope we got copyright for that. Uh, that <laughs> it's just something like that. It's just, it's an, a basic attitude that, you know, little things like that, you know, if we get the opportunity, you know, we'll, t- we'll absolutely take it home. Yeah, I completely agree as well. And I think it shows that there's a huge power as well around women's sport and the collective and what can be achieved when you look at 
Naomi Osaka and just the social change that she's been able to bring about and the fact that she's been so vocal about social justice and likewise with the um, WNBA as well and just how they were um, they were so strong that there's and Serena Williams has been so outspoken on so many occasions it shows that when things are important and, and need a voice that women's sports can be that powerful voice as well to force change so there's a like there's a huge reason to keep supporting it and to keep investing in it and to to keep keep it growing because it can not just change one person's lives but Courtney it can change a lot of people's lives and can change society as well. Yeah, I think just as you see as the game continues to grow and the platform gets bigger and bigger, then as athletes, women's voices become more important and people are listening and. When you turn on the TV and you see Naomi Osaka with the mask on with people's names, like people notice that and people, obviously that's something that's very important. And I think that that's huge because she's using her voice for change. And I think in other sports, football, rugby, everything, as the platform continues to get bigger then people can use their uh, voice and their platform for good. And I think that's something that, that will continue to grow with bigger sponsorships as, and as you said, more funding and things like that. So I think it's something that's obviously moving in the right direction. And as you can see from these examples, that it's something that can continue to be a great uh, uh, motivator for change. Another really important point that was made in the book as well, Amber, was just that we are all getting more educated about the female body over time as well. And it's pretty phenomenal, really, that there are so many uh, parts of it that we're still so um, lacking in knowledge in right now in, in the current situ the current uh, time. And the whole developments around periods are, have been really interesting and the sports science around it over the last, I suppose it's really only four or five years when they've been really factored into um, to, to training, to matches, to preparation and all that. And also the um, research on ACLs, like, and Sue points that out in the book like that, it's only kind of now that we're starting to understand as well that women have different bodies to men's and they might be more susceptible to two things like ACL. So when you throw in that little bit of science and also the fact that um, periods affect performance and um, the, the body and, and how you're feeling and all that, it's it's pretty phenomenal really to to realize that we're only we're only really starting to explore that now. I think as well that I, I don't know if Courtney would agree, but for me, working with Vera, Vera is definitely a coach who is very, you know, we have, she has to know when our cycle is, the physios here, the doctors need to know so that then they can plan accordingly training days. So there's days that you might have to be taken out of load, taken out of different exercises at the time because they don't want you to overdo it. You do a lot of stability work, you know, you do a lot of mobility and it's all just to make sure that to keep you as safe as possible because like, I think playing women's sport I think if you were to go through one to 30 of players in the team everybody's period is different everybody's period affects them a different way some keep people can function really really well and then there's other there's other days where people you know can barely get out of bed and like you have to take these things into consideration like it's it is a part and parcel of of being a woman we we have to have this you know we go through this this every four weeks and it, it can be an absolute chronic period of time and like I don't know about if Courtney would agree but like I know that when I'm looking at my schedule I have to factor in when I'm when I'm going to be due my period and when it's going to be happening and then I'm saying right okay you need to be really careful that day or hopefully I'm not playing a game that day or hopefully it's only one training that day because it really really does affect so much and as you said you know we were being told about our our body a hundred years ago that if we do exercise or we ride a bike we're gonna our uterus is gonna fall out and then a hundred years later we still haven't perfected the I suppose the education and understanding of periods and how they actually affect us day to day and you know I listened to a really good podcast last year where actually you know the girl was like we've absolutely normalized periods and how we feel she goes cramps are not a normal thing we should not be in that much pain she goes but that's the way it is and She's like, we need to learn now how to, I suppose, adapt to it, but also how to you know, sympathize with yourself a little bit more. And I think it's definitely something that, you know, you have to link, link it. And I know from my own club, 
injuries and periods are 100% linked. I know from different players who are in a part of their cycle where they're definitely more susceptible to injuries. And as you said, it's it's now with the ACL and the relationship with that, it's, these are little things now, if we really, really get on these and the education is there and I suppose the investment in the research, it's going to make such a long, you know, we're, you know, the idea of ACL injuries, we really, really hope are going to be, you know, completely decreased. You know, of course, things happen in sport. That's the risk we take. But, you know, you hope that it's not something that if I could have done this and this, that could have prevented it. I think when you get to those scenarios, then you can say, well, there's fault. But I really hope it is something that's starting to change. And I definitely feel like even the last five years, I feel improvements with it all the time. Sue in the book points out different markers that she feels really signified change. And for me, the Olympics in 2012 was one where I felt that men's and women's sport was really on um, an equal footing at that time anyway. But it's mad, it's not that long ago. And like Courtney, for you guys, just before we finish up, like it feels like it's a journey that was maybe only starting a decade ago, but like your sports careers will have coincided with that. So you're going to have played such a big part in how women's sport has evolved during that um, during that 10 year period and, and at such a rapid pace as well, which is really good to be able to be part of it and be on that journey and just see the progress that's been made and um, just to just to be a little bit part of the story as well. Yeah, I think that's so amazing. I think when you look back when we were growing up 20 years ago, it was harder to find female role models and athletes that were you could see. You didn't see them on the TV. You didn't see them in magazines, things like that. But obviously, nowadays, with everything just increasing, you can turn on the TV and see somebody playing whatever sport you're interested, in, whether it's golf, tennis, football. So I think that's amazing because we can see how it's changed from when we were growing up to how it is now. And it's just impacting that future generation. And hopefully it'll be easier for them to break out into sport and obviously maybe not have to deal with so many obstacles that we had to deal with, or even 50 years ago that you had to deal with. So I think just seeing things continue to progress and then that next generation taking that momentum and making change continue for the better, I think is amazing. And Amber, there is a chapter as well on uh, equal pay. You're there. We're there. We are definitely there. And again, Great history. They're going to be in volume two, I'd say. <laughs> <laughs> Follow up. Book. But yeah, as you know, as you said, just the difference that she mentioned about what, you know, has turned the tide and things like the Olympics in 2012. And I still think it wasn't until the 2016 Olympics that every woman, a woman could participate in every single event. And that's five years ago. And you're just thinking... Hundred years ago, there was no women in the Olympics, and it was the first, the first one. So, you know, what is the? I know it's the. What do you call the film about the hidden figures? And yeah. there's a great quote in that where the girl wants to go to college, but she has to do the night classes to be able to do the job in NASA. And she goes, "I want to be the first. And there always has to be someone who has to be the first. So, you know, the equal pay has been a huge thing, and I think definitely now we we have to just keep keep improving our standards on and off the pitch as well. Well, you guys are making your stamp on history as well and have done so over the last number of years. And I did say I look forward to reading volume two. And I do think there will be a volume two in the next mm -hmm. 10 years, because if that much change can be made in a decade, I am excited to think about what can happen um, in the next decade. So for anyone that is looking for it, it is a Game On, The Unstoppable Rise of Women's Sport by Sue Anstis. And I really recommend reading it. It's, it's brilliant. And you know what? It's really educational as well. You learn a lot about how far a women's sport has come and it will get you excited about what the future holds. So Amber and Courtney, thank you so much. And I look forward to the next video. Thanks, Marie.